Thank you, Professor Pistakori. That was such a wonderful presentation, and you did it in 35 minutes. Great. <laughs> Great. You owe me 10. <laughs> now we go to the three panelists. We have agreed quite the more particularly. Yes. <laughs> Narayani will be the first intervener. She's the founder member of ISIS. You all know that very well. At least I, 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 ISIS. She's been uh, very, very active in research work and publications. She has a lot of publications, but we have no time to read the whole list. So she's worked a lot on gender, on culture, on the Sharia law, on women's rights. So you can Google her, you can see a lot of her publications there. So Noraini, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Professor Piscatori, for a very interesting presentation there. I think I just want to make about not more than two comments, partly to um, fill in the blanks and to buttress some of the argument that's, uh, that, you can, that you've heard just now within uh, Professor Piscatori's analysis. I, I think in specific to Malaysia, the problem of Islamizing the state and religious politics in Malaysia first come with the conflation of Malay ethnic interests and religion, conflation of Islam with Islamic identity and buttressed by the new economic policy. And in so doing, in that first 20 decades and even after, we created a kind of siege mentality among the dominant population. I am a Malay and I am one of the benefactors of the new economic policy. So I could see how that new economic policy really, in a way to put it in layman's terms, spoil the Malays into thinking that, you know, it is, it is their right, it is their right to claim this and that. And working in 30, for 37 years in UKM did not nullify that sense and that observation. We can go into the details in the question and answer. And that's the danger when you conflate Islam with ethnic identity and ethnic interests, plus an authoritarian, authoritarian state, if I may use the old-fashioned term, starting from, unfortunately, one of our um, more respected prime minister. I've had personal dis debate and discussion with him, Dr. Mahade. He himself admitted that my intention was not as to Islamize Malaysia in the way as it turned out. He takes a more uh, kind of a reformation position, but then what medical doctors don't realize, which sociologists and political scientists <laughs> understand, that when you impose state rule, when you impose the role of the state onto society or onto bureaucracy, then that's when you start doing the damage. Now, on top of that, with the conflation of ethnic interests, Malay interests, and the identity of Islam, you bring in this um, education policy our national education policy has failed at all levels, from school to university, particularly in the public universities. And that failure of education has really done its job, has been very effective in dumbing down of our student. I should know, because in 1986, one of the seminars I want to hold in Jabatan Anthropology and Sociology was banned by students of UKM Islamic faculty acting in concert with some Satuan Ulama. 1996, when I want to hold an international conference interrogating fundamentalism, religious, political fundamentalism, it was banned by then the Minister of Education, who is now currently our Prime Minister. And then, of course, you know, in 2006, my book arguing about the role of Jakim and bureaucratic uh, institutions uh, in Islam, the book was banned in 2006. So that indicates in that, in the past 30 years, we've really gone down the slide, down the drain, as it were, in terms of damaging, in terms of um, undoing the good intention of NEP, of increasing, um, of improving access to, ed to higher education. And so it follows that the creation of the new middle class, particularly drawn from the Malay middle class, tends to be more conservative, 
tends to be more um, narrow in its perspective and understanding of Islam. Because the national education system, the school system, and there was no attempt at all, despite various memorandum being sent by active um, activist academics about introducing reforms within the school system, the secular regular school or the Islamic school. So I think I'm just filling up the blanks and trying to sort of fill up uh, most, most of Professor Piscatori's argument. So the, the stumbling down also lead to the syndrome of the silent majority. You can see in surveys, some of the ideas do come out, like the uh, Medeca Center survey shows that there's a rejection of Sharia when the question became a bit more detailed. But on the line, just on one general line, people would not be brief to say, no, we, what, to even question, no, we should not accept Sharia, we should first interrogate, we should first be critical, we should first question what is meant by Sharia, who defines the Sharia. You know, the whole scholarship, the whole understanding of Sharia has never really been undertaken. And when we want to introduce the, the more, uh, less conservative academics in the public university tries to invite speakers uh, like Abdullahi Anaim or the late Fatih Osman, you know, to introduce this debate about the theory of the hadith, about um, secular state, you always face up difficulty of, you know, there is no freedom of expression or you have to fulfill a lot of conditions. I know m many of my fellow NGO activists knows this. So in concert with the, despite the economic development, you see that there is no development, no opening up of knowledge, of understanding of the education, secular and also religion on Islam. And I think Riaz Hassan, in his two works, one of the survey looks at about eight or ten Muslim countries. And in all the other Muslim countries except Malaysia, when you have economic development and when you have greater expansion of the middle class, you have a far more opening up of understanding and questioning religious rules about the role of the state, about the role of bureaucracy and Islam. But not in Malaysia. As Malaysia develops economically, it becomes far more conservative. So that in itself needs, um, needs further study and needs us to understand. And I think the dumping down from education, education at the school level to university level, you produce a less critical population of middle class of adults. And whenever I try to encourage students to organize a far more critical debates, they finally rest on this one question. Prof, but what is your uh, authority? You are not uh, an ulama, you are not teaching in the Islamic faculty, you're only a sociologist. So that, that speaks in itself. You know? So the, the lack of critical thinking, the dumbing down of, of students, of, of education, of Muslims, of middle class, and the authoritarian state. And that's it. And plus, as I've argued in 2006, the uh, manipulation of our electoral system will maintain the, no the dominance of UMNO in forming government and in, and in so doing, dumbing down the, our whole citizen. We can't even make an argument. 2008, my book nearly got banned on sharing the nation, making a positive argument about positively evaluating our Medeca constitution. They refused to hold even an academic seminar debate on that his important historical point. So on that note, I shall stop and we can continue further this discussion in the Q&A. Thank you.